On today's Locked on Jayhawks, lessons learned for KU top takeaways, good and bad, from the 2023 to 2024 season. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. Give me a follow on social media at D Johnson Radio. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Locked on Jayhawks and making it your first listen every day. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. And on today's edition of Locked on Jayhawks, we're uh, going into the classroom. Lessons learned for the Jayhawks in the 2023 to 2024 season. What can they take away from this year? Because you know, if you have a bad season, you might as well learn from it. What are some of the good takeaways? Because there still were some good things I think you can take away from this year. What were some lessons learned the hard way? And then we'll finish up with KU Women's Basketball on this episode of the show. First, we are brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $200,000 in or $200, excuse me, in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, that's $200 in bonus bets of your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. So let's start with the good. Let's uh, introduce it that, you know, normally it's like, do you want the good or the bad news first? Normally with the bad news first, let's start with the good. Let's, let's ease into this thing a little bit here. I do think as much of a rough season as it was for Kansas, especially to expectations, not just, I guess, program season wide expectations every year you go into it with high expectations but also the expectations that were put upon you when you were the preseason number one team you know obviously you didn't reach those expectations but there also is that that easy reminder that Kansas is still a hell of a program and yeah maybe they haven't had like a ton of second weekend tournament success over the last you know whatever it's been six seasons albeit you had the the one COVID canceled year and you had no uh, Bill Self in last year's tournament to try to help you with some of those things. Like the, the fact that this program is sustaining itself as one seeds, two seeds, three seeds, four seeds every year in the NCAA, like you just keep taking cracks at it. It was like Bill Self in the Elite Eight. Like you keep making it to the Elite Eight. Eventually you're going to win some of these games. And so he had some of the Elite Eight losses. Well, guess what? The last two Elite Eights he's made, he's been able to won and, and get through. So like keep making it in as a one, two, three, four seed. You're going to make runs in given years. And, and that's kind of the way to play it because March can be so random. It's just like, just take as many dart throws as you possibly can. And that's the thing here. As, as rough as this season was compared to those expectations, they still got a freaking four seed and won a tournament game in a really down year. And I know that's not the measurement for Kansas basketball. You're looking to win big 12 championships, final four banners, national championship banners. And, and that is totally understandable. And those are the expectations. And by those expectations, this season did not live up to those, but that's kind of the point here that like, it could be worse um, in your down year. You got a four seed, which for a lot of other programs would be their up year or like um, uh, upper middle year. You know, you had one home loss all year long. You beat Connecticut, who is the defending national champion, is in the Sweet 16. You beat Tennessee, who is in a Sweet 16 right now, right? Um, you, you beat a Yale team who upset Auburn in the first round of the NCAA tournament, right? You, you beat a bunch of Big 12 teams who made the tournament or uh, like you beat Houston, who's in the Sweet 16, right? Like if this is what a down year is for Kansas, obviously the idea is don't repeat this year many more times, but we've been through this before as that the idea that, you know, if this is your low point, you're going to look back on this in 10 years and be like, yeah, that, that's just unbelievable uh, and incredible what they were able to do. Because, like, let's not forget, I mean, there were some years in the Roy Williams era where they were getting like an eight seed. You know what I mean? Or they were getting like a six seed. So uh, national title year in 88, there were six seed. Could you imagine going into that tournament, what, what KU fans were, were feeling? I don't know. Uh, maybe that was a little bit different. Not every game, like aired nationally and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, the other good takeaway from this is I think the one last ride bump still exists for Kansas, which I think is going to be pertinent going into this next season, possibly for Kansas. And what I mean by that is, and I think you see this nationally across Kansas uh, or across college basketball, and it's, it's not new that it's happening in Kansas, but they've been on a nice little uh, heater here of late. So 2017, you get your one last ride, one final season, basically is what I'm saying, where it's a player coming back for that one final season and going, hey, this is my last year no matter what. Like, I'm going to leave it all out on the line. I'm going to have this big improvement. I'm going to have a great year. So you had that with Frank Mason. He takes the jump from being a good all Big 12 
level point guard to be national player of the year. Then you get the next year, Devontae Graham again goes from being like all Big 12 level good to being all American uh, in his one last ride. Uh, 19 didn't really happen. Then 2020, you had the one last ride of Yudoka Azubuki after he came back, where it was like, is he going to go in the draft? Is he not? He was kind of injured through the process, comes back and is maybe the most dominant player in college basketball that year. Then you get the uh, one last ride of Ochag Baji into his senior year, which he came in, kind of same thing with Frank, where it's like, okay, he's like an all-Big 12 caliber player. He turns into an All-American and National Player of the Year candidate. Then uh, Jalen Wilson, again, good player, but then he comes back and he becomes an All-American and just a stud. Kevin Kohler this past year was the latest one where it was like, okay, you have one last ride here, and you turn from being an all-Big 12 third-team performer to being a player who, if he didn't have all these injuries, would have ended up on one of the uh, main like three All-American lists, right? So that ride has still existed for KU, even in the portal era, with everything that's happening. And in fact, you have basically three straight years where it's happened with a wing. What does that mean for this next season with like Dewan Harris? It's his final season, right? Now we've seen Dewan in the NCAA tournament games really, um, I would say, pick up his game offensively a little bit. I'd love to see that if that was over the course of regular season. Now, one of the big things I think they can do, and this is something that Bill Self said earlier this season, was that Dewan is better as a 30 to 32 minute guy where you have another ball handler who can handle the ball and handle some of the minutes there to where Dewan can exert more energy you know, defending and when he has to scoring the basketball and stuff. And this year, maybe that wasn't as possible. So if you bring in another combo guard, I think it'll elevate Dewan's game a little bit more there. And I wouldn't be surprised if he still has another gear that he can get to for KU. Well, what about KJ Adams too, right? I mean, part of with KJ, we have to kind of wait and see the fit and everything. Like is Hunter Dickinson going to come back? If he doesn't, would they add another center? Would they play KJ at the five? Is he going to play the four? Like, oh, what's kind of going to be the fit there? And how is that going to work? Is he going to come back? All that sort of stuff, right? Um, but same thing there. Like basically what I'm saying is I remember going into Frank Mason's senior year. And at the time I was working with rock chalk sports talk and I was having conversations about going into that 2016, 17 season in which Frank eventually won national player of the year. There were a lot of conversations that off season about who's going to lead this team in scoring. You know, that's just kind of a fun off season content thing that doesn't really matter that much. No, probably not, but it's kind of a fun fodder to talk about. And it was like, okay, yeah, Frank's kind of Mr. Consistent, dependable, like good player. But Devontae Graham, this guy's starting to like be on the up and up. Like, could he be the guy? Or what about Josh Jackson? He's coming into the program. Like, could he be the guy that leads you in scoring that year? And then it ends up being Frank, and it's not even close. He averages 20 points per game, and he wins national player of the year. Um, my point being, I think sometimes we can get caught up in the idea that, okay, this guy's been the same guy we've seen for two straight years or the same guy we've seen for three straight years. And in reality, they're still 20, 21, 22, 23 years old. They are still developing basketball players. So don't just assume that a player, even if they've been the same player, they've been sophomore to junior year or whatever, that they're not, they, they don't have another gear that they can get to because maybe it's not the best thing to expect that, but it does absolutely happen, especially for this Kansas program. I think another big good lesson that we learned for KU this year was what Johnny Furphy was and, and kind of the Johnny Furphy breakout because that was kind of a, a nice surprise. He was obviously a late get for KU as a freshman. And the idea there with Furphy was that I think when they brought him in, you're going to be a two-year guy. You know, you come off the bench this year, you make an impact as a bench player, and then next year you're ready to go as, as a real player for this team. And he obviously got in the starting lineup a little bit early. I think part of that was an opportunity that was open because nobody took that role. Like if Nick Timberlake or Marco Jackson would have fit to the hype of what the preseason would have been, then those guys would have just ended up starting and Furphy would have probably stayed off the bench the whole year long. But then once he got that opportunity, he really seized it and he looked excellent looks. I mean, he, he could be a first round draft pick. If he goes this year, um, he is somebody who, if he does come back, like for my money, he's going to have a great opportunity to be like a big 12 player of the year candidate and to be an all American. That's how highly I think of him. If he does come back next year for Kansas. Uh, the other last big lesson here I had on the positive side was I, I think just glad to be moving forward from the NBA NCAA repercussions soon. So this year you still had to deal with them in a way that the past, whatever it was the past six years, you had to deal with more of the, the black cloud hanging over your head. The idea of something could be happening and it's almost this anticipation game that's getting you. Then this year was the first year where you're dealing with the repercussions of the actual tangible punishments, right? Taking down 2018 Final Four banner, which I, I still think that stuff is so incredibly stupid, whatever. Um, but the scholarship one is, is kind of the big one as it pertains to this season, right? Uh, in that Kansas 
basically you lose three scholarships over the course of three seasons this year and the next two years. And they basically opted to try to divvy out several of them this season. In addition to that, you used one of the scholarships on a player who's redshirting Zach Clements. So you did see real tangible repercussions from the NCAA situation, honestly, more this year than you did with the cloud hanging over you because you still want a title with some of that happening. But now you really are moving forward. You know, last year felt like the start of the process of moving forward because you actually found out where your punishments are going to be. And maybe the punishments ended up being a little bit more, I don't know, harsh is still too strong a word, but more harsh than you expected in terms of how it really did impact this season. But now you have gotten a majority of those scholarships out of the way. You're going to have more scholarships available moving forward. You're going to be moving further out of this NCAA stuff for recruiting and selling the program and all that stuff to kids and not have as much negative recruiting, at least about that coming against your way. So uh, I, I think that's a good thing to be moving forward that you are going to be moving on from that continually if you're Kansas. All right, let's continue on. What lessons do they have to learn the hard way this year for KU? First, this episode of the show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That is $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Final four MOP, who's going to make the final four. You know, especially if, if your bracket is doing bad right now, this is basically your chance to get a second chance bracket. So enjoy it. Have fun with it. Bet responsibly. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. FanDuel, official sportsbook of the Locked On Network. We're also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, continuing on, what lessons did Kansas have to learn the hard way this season for KU, basically things that didn't go well. Well, I mean, th this is really, I don't know, is this like the first time this, there have been other years where KU has been more limited in having them. Certainly, I think of the 2021 season. Um, maybe that was more just, you had players who were still burgeoning into that. But you got to have bucket getters and shooting. And as much as Bill Self, even in like the early parts of, you know, his career at Kansas, when he was running the high low and you would have really talented and skilled big men, Kansas still had like really good shooting teams from the outside. Like you go back and look at it and um, like, like go back to, I don't know, uh, let's say 2006 or something like that. They're 45th and three point percentage, 2007, they're 22nd, 2008, they're 14th, right? Like every year they were top uh, 100 outside of Bill Self's first year there until 2012, which that was more of a grinded out team. And then besides that, you had top 100 years like every year through 2018, except for like one in there. So like they've always had the bucket getters, whether where you're thinking of guards or wings or whoever it's been, they've got guys who have been able to create their own shot and get buckets off the bounce. And yes, some of the lighter years for Kansas, which have been, I think, some of their worst years, they've maybe only had one or two of those guys on the court at all times, right? So you think of that 2021 season, well... Okay, Ochag Baji was solid at that point, but he wasn't the same guy you saw in the national championship year a year later, right? Like David McCormick had a good back half of the season in Big 12 play, so that would be one that you could give it to on the block, and, and he was able to you know, make stuff happen. Uh, Jalen Wilson was, was kind of a bit of that, but he was still growing in his role, but you didn't really have it from the guard position as much with you know some of the guys that you were getting there. So um, I, I think it's so incredibly important. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I think at all times... The best teams are the one where you basically have, you have at least three, probably four guys who can get a bucket on the court at all times. So that doesn't mean everybody is a lead at offense. That doesn't mean I, it's a very, you know, it, it's not one of those things where I can be like, well, if you 
to qualify here, you have to be shooting this percentage or you have to be doing this or that. No, it's kind of, you know, it as you see it, but like, for instance, okay, you go back to the 2022 national championship team for Kansas. Well, I wouldn't quite call Dwan Harris a bucket getter, right? But who else was he on the court with when, if you're just looking at the starting lineup, because you could also bring Remy Martin off the bench and then add another bucket getter in there. Ochi Agbaji, okay, he averaged like 20 points per game. He was an All-American. Yes, bucket getter. Christian Brown, first round draft pick. Yes, that dude could go get his own bucket, right? Jalen Wilson, yes, he could go get his own bucket. And there's different ways of getting your bucket. Some guys are drivers, like Jalen was. Some guys are three-point shooters. Some guys are beat you off the bounce, but you have to have guys who can get your bucket. And then you have post-up scores, right? Like Dave isn't going to catch the ball at the top of the three-point arc and go beat you. But if you threw it to him in a half-court setting, and then you could also throw in Mitch Lightfoot. And he had a very efficient hook shot that year, where it was like, okay, that is a bucket getter, right? And so you look at this team, and it was like, okay, Dewan Harris, not really a bucket getter this year. Um, Timberlake and Omarco weren't really bucket getters for you this year. So now you're kind of down that way. Furphy, in a way, was kind of a bucket getter in the same way that Christian Brown was, like elite transition player, but Brown had even more in the half court. So that one would be kind of a half to. Hunter Dickinson was a bucket getter in the half court. KJ kind of plus or minus as well, but you, you're running out of guys who can really take it off the dribble and create for you. And that's the other thing. Like you need at least one or two guys who can create off the dribble for you in those half court settings. And that's what, you know, like Jalen Wilson was able to do, or some of the best years, Devonte Graham or Frank Mason were are able to do. And you didn't have that this year. And I think that really hurt. I spent too much time on that one. Uh, other lessons learned the hard way in this day and age, it is really hard defensively to have a slow center who can't at least hedge well. Kansas has had good defenses under Bill Self without a center that's been, I would say, a super quick or super nimble guy. Like, I don't know. Obviously, you think of some of the best years of Bill Self. They've, they've had this, like, dominant uh, rim protector and, and maybe shot blocker on the inside, whether it's with, you know, Cole Aldridge or Jeff Withy or uh, Yudoka Azabuke just, just a few years ago. But they've had some other good teams defensively Without one of those guys, like uh, I, I guess you could kind of go back to the 08 team. Like that was the best defense in the country. And like Sasha Khan was a seven footer. He was solid. Darnell Jackson, solid defensively. Right. But um, neither of those guys is like fleet of foot or anything like that. Um, you take a look at uh, like the 2016, 2017 teams, like the, the 2017 team wasn't as good defensively. They were 24th. They're still top 25. The 2016 one low key was third in the country on Ken Palm in defensive efficiency. Okay. And both those teams had Landon and Lucas starting at the five, like Landon and Lucas wasn't an elite shot blocker and he wasn't like a switchable defender. He wasn't like the most nimble guy in the world. Right. But if you can be smart, defensively like that's one of the things if you can know your positioning um bill self can scheme around it like same with david mccormick right like you look at uh some of the years with david mccormick over the last month of the season in 2021 kansas had one of the best defenses in the country finished top 15 that year national title year they finished 17th um so like again david mccormick not the most nimble guy in the world and he had to play with like a broken foot throughout his career at kansas so like that made him even less mobile than he could have been it was kind of the the funny part about like the crab defense he looked like a crab shuffling up and down playing defense but high effort knowing where to be and at least mobile enough to at least hedge a ball screen or ice a ball screen to make things a little bit more difficult you saw none of that this year with Hunter Dickinson. And I do think as dominant as he is on the offensive end of the court and as productive as he is overall, I just, it, it's, it's not impossible to win with it. Like I, I continue to, in my mind, go back to the idea that Hunter Dickinson is freshman year made an elite eight with Michigan as a one seed. And that team was a possession away from playing in a final four. And then who knows what happens from there. Right. So like, it's, it's not impossible, but I, I liken it to if you have a slow center defensively, like think about the reason a lot of Big Ten teams have struggled in the tournament. Like I go back to like the Iowa team's Luca Garza, who's like national player of the year, but they're losing in the first weekend of the tournament because they get exploited on the defensive end with some of the slow bigs. Kofi Coburn at Illinois is another example of this. You like didn't make it to a second weekend. Some of these dominant bigs, but once you get into a tournament setting and teams will just spam the same play over and over and attack you over and over with ball screens, what happened to Gonzaga, it makes it a lot tougher. So it's... I, I, the metaphor I was going for, I liken it to 
having a middle tier quarterback in the NFL. You can still win a championship. You can still win a Super Bowl in the NFL with a middle tier quarterback, but everything around him has to be more tightened up and more perfect. And that's how I view it. If you have a slower big man, right? That Michigan team had basically, I mean, you had a early second round pick in uh, was it Isaiah livers at one of the wing spots. And then you had a first round pick. Who's like a borderline all-star every year now in Franz Wagner. If you have a couple wings that can be switchable and cover up a lot defensively, like that's one way that you can kind of make up for it. If you have a bunch of shooting around him that can kind of make up for it. So it's not that it's impossible, but it just makes it a little bit harder. Um, but it is something to kind of keep in mind moving forward. I also think the portal, as I'm looking at it from the Kansas perspective, should be for supplementing a roster, not building it, right? Because um, I will say this, a lot of the teams who have had success with the portal, it's been guys who've stayed two years. Think about the Texas team that Chris Beard put together last year, made the Elite Eight. Year before, you know, they were out, what, in, in the first weekend? Um, and I, I think in the second round, I want to say, to Purdue. A lot of times the guys who stay two years, that's when they really hit their success out of the transfer portal. So I do think that is kind of interesting. Uh, UConn, for instance, Tristan Newton, he was good last year, but he's like all American good this year. So uh, maybe that's something good for Kansas. But I think uh, specifically for Bill Self rosters, portal is more about supplementing than building your, your foundation, so to speak. I also don't think you can just automatically think every freshman is going to give you an upgrade. We're already going to see that in the off season. Everybody's going to assume that these three freshmen coming in are all going to be upgrades over Kansas, but we see it all the time, whether it was on Marco Jackson or MJ Rice or Bryce Thompson or Quentin Grimes, you know, it's a different varying degrees. Some of those guys are still in the rotation. Some of those guys are starters. Some of those guys are playing big minutes. Uh, but, you know, it, it's hard for some freshmen. It takes some time. Like Wayne Selden, it took a couple of years, right? So don't just automatically think just because a player's new and shiny and has a high recruiting ranking, he's going to automatically hit the ground running. I think that pertains to when you're building a roster. Don't just assume that, oh, they upgraded this position because this freshman is ranked 27th in the country. And, and that player could come in and be good. Kansas had a lot of success with freshmen. Johnny Furphy and Grady Dick and Josh Jackson and Joel Embiid and Andrew Wheat and, and Javier Henry and all these guys. So it's not like it can't happen. I'm just saying don't expect all of them to make this big impact. Uh, the last lesson is just don't want Kansas number one in the AP poll. Besides Kansas over the last two decades, 13 of the 15 AP preseason number one teams made the second weekend of the tournament and seven of the 15 made the final four. So like when you're AP preseason number one, you're like basically guaranteed to be a really good team, except for Kansas, because every time they've done it under Bill Self, they've lost in the first weekend. And that is just a weird thing that has happened for Kansas. So I guess you root against them being number one. Yeah, just go into a season. We're number two. We're number two. That's what you want for KU. All right, let's finish up here. Talk a little bit about KU women's basketball on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. First, this episode of the show is brought to you by our friends at Nissan for this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Oakland Grizzlies are this week's Nissan Rogue. This team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in the first-round upset against the Kentucky Wildcats, giving Oakland which is in Michigan, by the way, their biggest win in program history. They say, win life, go Rouge, and that's exactly what the Golden Grizzlies have done here. Maybe you're like Jack Golke. You want to fire up a bunch of threes. That's what it's like firing up your engine. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, so as I'm recording this on Locked On, thank you for joining us today and making this uh, part of your podcast routine every day. Uh, we will have a early off-season guard targets on tomorrow's episode of the show. But as I'm recording this, uh, I am old. I will be going to bed soon, and I have a baby in the fold, so that is part of the reason why, so don't make fun of me too much. Um, but anyway, I, we are at halftime of the KU women's basketball game. And currently they're trailing USC 33-24 to in the second round. USC the one seed in the region hosting the game because the uh, first two rounds are at the highest seed who gets to host. Um, so Juju Watkins picked up two fouls in the first quarter for USC. They kept playing her through it, but kind of a bad start for KU. Honestly, good that they're even within nine because – uh, it was at one point USC kind of ballooned up the lead. I think it was 24 to nine at one point, And that included USC leading 16 to zero 
in points off of turnovers. So if KU can just tighten up the turnovers, USC's hitting a lot of threes too. Some of them have been contested and well-played defense. You just hope that those stop falling in the second half, stop turning the ball over, and maybe you can get back into this thing. Maybe you can continue to get Juju Watkins in a little bit more foul trouble. She had an excellent start to this one before she had the two fouls. I'll say this, though, and, and we'll wait and see what kind of happens here. I do think this game is extremely important for uh, Kansas because as much as it is a bit playing with house money, you're the eight seed playing on the road against the one seed. Um, I, I think it really will show what the trajectory or the ceiling of this program is and can be in the Brandon Schneider era. And I mean, this is such a super senior laden team. You have, I think, three super seniors on the roster, three COVID seniors on the roster, and then a fourth senior on the roster, I believe, with Wyvette Mayberry. And honestly, it might be four super seniors. Um, it's hard to not see that as like, OK, when you build up a roster where you have that many seniors and super seniors, and, you know, you come back after a team who won a tournament game and then won an NIT, that this is kind of a, a destination type season in, in terms of what I'm talking about here is like that you build it for one special year and this would be that special year. Now, obviously, you have a stud freshman in Samaya Nichols. So that really does raise your ceiling and what you can be moving forward, that if you get to build around that, that maybe the ceiling does get higher after this moving forward. Maybe the recruiting keeps up after this moving forward. But um, when you look at it, you can easily be like, well, Kansas loses four of their starters after this season. So you better take advantage of this run now before you lose all these players. And if the ceiling of the program ends up being you're an eight seed that can win at max one tournament game, you know, that's not that's not bad. Like, that's solid, right? Like, that's fine. But I just – I continue to have high hopes for the program because you do have these great facilities. You do have great basketball fans here that you're still trying to kind of grow for the women's game. And – I, I think there's no excuse why this can't be a top 25 national program and why this can't be a program that's making the tournament every year, not just peeking in as an eight seed and winning one tournament game. And I'm not trying to make any declaratory statements. I'm just saying I really hope they can win this game and come back in the second half because to me it would really show that, yes, the ceiling of this program is for them to be that level of team as opposed to, okay, nice season. It was cool. Great turnaround for them, which all of those things would be true. I, I just want there to be that next year to kind of get to. And I think that's what this represents. Uh, if you can beat USC or come back and, and certainly make it a game at the end of things. All right. Uh, we'll be back to break that down. If Kansas does come back and win, uh, we'll also have a portal episode talking about the guard position. What could be back for KU next year? What they could try to add, who are some player names to keep an eye on at this point in time targets to uh, watch So make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast, including on a YouTube page. We'll see you next time on locked on Jayhawks.